Good morning, viewers. It's a new day. Welcome to today's devotion with the Daily Fountain, the devotional guide of the Church of Nigeria Anglican Communion. Invite your family and friends. Get your Bible and your Daily Fountain manual while our devotional leader takes us on today's devotion. Hello, friend. I thank God for making us know this brand new day, the seventh day of March 2022. I'm glad you are at that end hearing us, and we are at this end to fellowship with you. Today, by God's grace, we'll be considering the topic, the supremacy of Christ's priesthood and we'll be looking at the Bible passage Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14 it will run through chapter 5 1 to 10 Hebrews chapter 4 14 to chapter 5 Verse 10. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subjected to weakness. Because of this, he is required as for the people, so also for himself to offer sacrifices for sins. And no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was, so also did Christ glorify not himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also said in another place, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of God. Now, basically this scripture we just read now, the author here is a kind of exhorting his audience who were Jews, Christians, believers, Jews, and um, the author knew the recipients very well 
their condition. These were people that passed through thick and thin in terms of persecution. Some of them, their property were either stolen because they were believers or confiscated just because they were believers. Some were stoned to death. Some were tortured, tormented in diverse manners just because of their faith. Some were beaten. Some were bound and thrown into prison because of their faith. Some were caught into two with a saw because of their faith. Some tied to the stake and burned to ashes because of their faith. But one thing about these believers is that they never gave up. They persevered in their faith. But at this point, as at the time when the author of the epistle to the Hebrews was writing to them, he perceived that the believers, they were at the verge of entering into apostasy, the verge of denying the faith which they had in Christ. So he admonished them to hold on to their profession. Hold on to your faith in other ways. What was really the thing that was shaking their faith? Was it persecution? Of course, no. They persevered in persecution. They held on to Christ in persecution. But these same believers who held on to Christ in persecution, at this point in time, they were Judaizers. People who were teaching that the, the priesthood of Christ is not to be compared with that of Aaron, what we call Aaronic or Levitical priesthood. They were teaching that Christ's priesthood does not hold ground. In other words, was not authentic. So these believers, their faith was shaken. Because you can imagine when the role of priesthood is taken away from the religion or the faith which they professed. It's a different ballgame. It means Christianity was not worth it. So many of them were at the verge of denying Christ. They were at the verge of going back to Judaism. So this author had to write to them, to admonish them, to exhort them, to encourage them, to hold on. And he took time to explain the supremacy of Christ. And that is what this epistle is all about in this particular pas passage we just read now. We have seen that these believers, they were theologically immature. Theologically immature. They were not matured at all. They were not people that were strong in their faith. So they were shaken. And that is what he was addressing. He started telling them that it is not as these people are saying it. Now, he was first of all looking at what qualifications. And that, 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 that's the angle we are going to look at it from three angles as the time permits us. Number one, the qualifications for a man to be a high priest. What does it take for a man to be a high priest? Looking at the order of Aaronic priesthood. And number two, we are going to talk about the supremacy of Christ's high priesthood over that of the uh, Aaronic or Levitical priesthood. And the third part we will look at is what did the finished work of Christ, his priesthood, bring to us or has to offer to us as men? These are the three areas. And these are the areas that the author pinched his tent on, to persuade the people, to persuade his recipients that the priesthood of Christ is as valid as the Levitical priesthood, the priesthood of the Jews, as it were, instituted in the time of Aaron. And then let's go to the first one, the qualifications for a man to be a high priest. And that we find in chapter 5, where we read, verse 1 to 4. This was handled there. Number 1, in verse 1, he said, 
he must be selected from among men for a man to be a high priest. That man must be selected from among men. It's not a spirit that is coming to be the high priest. He must be selected from among men. So he must be a man. And secondly, you noted in that same verse 1, he must represent men before God. And that's his assignment, a go-between. Somebody that is going to represent others before God. An intermediary, as it were. So that man that will be a high priest must be able to perform this function. And then number three, he must offer gifts and sacrifices. Number four, in verse two you find that he must be able to deal gently with men. Because he's a man. He'll be able to understand how it feels. It's not like a man who has never married before. He has not known what marriage is all about. And is coming to counsel somebody who is married. At times he doesn't hold. Because there are some intricacies in marriage that he may not understand. And when he's giving the counsel, it might be lopsided. So Jesus, according to the author, he was a man. He felt all our feelings. He was subjected to our emotions. So that man must be able to deal gently with other men. They say those people who have been broken, they become master menders because they have been broken. So they, 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 know, they know how it is exactly and they know how to handle those who are in that situation. And then number five, that is in verse three, he must offer sacrifices for sin. Not just for the people. He must be able to offer sacrifices for sin for all the people involved, including himself. So this man must be able to fulfill or perform this function of offering sacrifices for sin. And then he must be God appointed. Very, very important. He must not be self acclaimed, self appointed. So, these are some of the qualifications that somebody must meet before he becomes a high priest. And may I announce to you that the author of this epistle in verse 5 to 10 of chapter 5, he was able to explain that all these qualifications, ranging from the first one, were made by Jesus Christ. To start with, Jesus was selected among men. Jesus represented men before God. Jesus offered sacrifices and gifts. After he offered his own body, he offered his life as the Lamb of God, as a sacrifice. So Jesus fits into these qualifications. He met all. So on that note, Jesus is a high priest. But let's look at the second part, which um, talks about the supremacy of Christ's priesthood over that of Aaron. I see that Jesus is now having a kind of supremacy in his priesthood over that of Aaron. Number one, the high priest in the Aaronic order needed tabernacle or temple for atonement. Jesus didn't need that at all. Jesus went directly into the presence of God in heaven. You know, in the Aaronic priesthood, the high priest will move from the outer court. He goes into the holy place, which today fits into what we call the lower chancel, and then he moves on to the upper chancel, where you have the altar. Your, your pastors stay in the upper chancel today. But then, between the lower chancel, which was called then the holy place, and the upper chancel, then it was called the sanctum sanctorum in Latin word, which is holy of holies. There was a thick cotton separating the two places in the temple. The Holy of Holies was a kind of confinement for the Shekinah glory of God. Shekinah glory. 
It was where the presence of God was resident in the temple. So the high priest will walk from the lower court, get to the holy place where you have the shoe bread table, and then he moves to the incense altar. From there, he burns the incense, and then he enters. The, the, the idea behind burning the incense, of course, is to, to blindfold him. He cannot behold with his sinful eye the glory of God. So he burns the incense, and the smoke of the incense blindfolds him. He cannot go to go and make the sacrifice. Where you have the mercy seat of God, you have the covenant and all those in the in the in the in the in the holy of holies. So the, the, Jesus didn't need that temple at all. He went straight to heaven. And then just like the high priest, people will stand outside, they'll be waiting for him to go and do the atonement. People in Acts chapter 1, the Bible says they were looking at him. They beheld him while he was taken up into heaven to offer the sacrifice with his own blood. He went into the presence of God. Hallelujah. He's seated by God in heaven. And when he went there, he went into the throne of grace. I will take time to explain that later on. Into the throne of grace. In the earthly temple, they had the mercy seat. But now Jesus moved into the throne of grace. He went into the presence of God. So he didn't need that. In that wise, he's supreme to the Aaronic priesthood. And also we find that the Aaronic priesthood is just a mere man. Just a mere man. But Jesus was more than a mere man. He was man, yes, 100% yes. And he was 100% God. Very man, very God. Jesus was the Son of God. And that we find in the scripture, verse 14, where the author said, Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus, the Son of God. Verse 14 of chapter 4. So, that is the difference. Jesus was God. He was the Son of God. That makes him supreme to the Aaronic priesthood. Again, the atonement of the Aaronic priesthood was done with the blood of animal. But Christ's priesthood, Christ atoned with his own blood. Hallelujah. He atoned with his blood. That makes him supreme. How do I know? The Aaronic priesthood was done yearly. But Christ's priesthood was once and forever. The blood satisfied and met the requirements of God. The demand of God concerning the salvation of man. It was done once and it was accepted in heaven. Now if you look at John chapter 1 verse 29, the Bible says there, the next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So Jesus was the lamb. It wasn't goat. It wasn't cow or boo. He was the lamb. And in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12, he said, Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. So this is the supremacy of Christ's priesthood over that of Aaron. Jesus gave himself to us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And that is found in uh, Timothy chapter 2 verse 14. Again, the Aaronic priesthood atonement for sin, the, the sin of the priest was done there. Jesus did not have sin. But the sin in Aaronic priesthood have to be atoned for. When he goes into the Holy of Holies, 
the priest will atone for his own sin first. Before he will atone for his family, and then he will atone for the people. That we find in Leviticus chapter 15. If you read verse 17, you find that clearly written there. But Jesus did not need to atone for his own sin. He rather atoned for the sin of you and I. So that makes him supreme. He was without sin. Makes him very supreme to Aaronic priesthood. So you can see that these believers, they were wallowing in ignorance. They really didn't know the depth, the height, the width of what Jesus did for us. And this author was writing to get them to know this. To get them out of the cocoon of this ignorance. Ignorance can destroy you, child of God. That's why we must know. God said in his word, my people have gone at, into captivity for ignorance. They have gone into bondage in Osea. Ignorance. So he was getting them out of that cocoon of ignorance. He also told them that ironic priesthood, the priest is always from the Levitical or ironic descent. In other words, he must be somebody from that family. But in that of Jesus, he was directly called by God. Jesus was directly appointed of God by God according to the order of Melchizedek. And of course, you know, the Jews, they had the priesthood of Melchizedek, the great or high esteem. So when the author was writing to tell them according to the order, they understood what he meant. What the author meant. They clearly understood that it's valid. Even though Jesus was not of ironic descent, God called him directly. And they understood all those clearly. In um, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1 to 3, you can find that there. He said in verse 1, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from slaughter. You will go down and you will find uh, it in verse, uh, probably verse 3. He said, without father, Melchizedek was without father, without mother, without descent, having neither the beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abided a priest continually. So we find many things here that Jesus didn't have that ironic descent. He was in the order of Melchizedek, called directly by God. And again, we find here that Jesus also doubled in the office of the priest and the king. It was not so with the ironic priesthood. So that gives him an edge. That makes him stand out taller than Aaronic priesthood. And this, the believers, the Hebrew believers didn't know. Jesus also had a perpetual, like where we just read in verse 3, he had a perpetual and permanent priesthood. Aaronic priesthood ended at the death of the high priest. Another one takes over. But Jesus' own is continuous, perpetual, forever. So these are some of those advantages he had. The Aaronic priesthood will be done, the the atonement is done every year on a yearly basis. But Jesus priesthood once and for all. And that's what we're enjoying today. Around the priesthood, if the priest is going into the Holy of Holies and the atonement is not done properly, unlike today, now somebody will come, Father, I wash my hands in innocence. That might go about your altar, lifting the voice of thanksgiving. I mean, why? He doesn't mean it. He has just left the brothel or the hotel room and the lady is still there and is coming to do that. It, during the time of Aaronic priesthood, God will just hit in kush and that's why they used to tie rope on the waist, on the, on the leg of the, the, the high priest so that if God kills him there because of his sins, they will just drag him out. It was not so with Jesus. Jesus was with us sin. And that's why he's inviting us that we should come boldly into the throne of grace. The throne of grace is where God 
He knows our sin. He does nothing about it. He knows our sin. Instead of doing something, he gives us a reward for what we do not merit. But in the throne of mercy, God only knows something about us, the evil we have done. He doesn't reward us. It ends there. He just leaves us. He doesn't, he doesn't reward us. He forgives us. So, child of God, I implore you today to come into the presence of the Most High God. You have access there. You don't need the priest to move on. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you for fellowshipping with us today. We invite you to join us tomorrow morning, same time, same station, for another special edition of the Daily Fountain. If you are led to sponsor or support this program, please contact the numbers and email all showing on your screen. 